Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing today about how energy efficiency means business. And you know it really does. It's not just a clever title, although it is also a clever title. I am Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change policies to policymakers. We have also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. I am very grateful to our hosts today, Representative Marcy Captor of Ohio and Representative Jeff Fortenberry of Nebraska. This is our fourth annual energy efficiency means uh, business briefing. And since the very beginning, we've had the full support from these two key appropriators. That committed bipartisan support sends a very important message about the wide range of benefits of energy efficiency and the need to ensure that the Department of Energy has what it needs for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Rural Renewable Energy to do its critical work. Before we go any further, it is my privilege to introduce our hosts who are joining us today via video recording. We will hear first from Representative Kaptur, who chairs the House Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee, followed by Representative Fortenberry, who is the ranking member of the Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee, and as you will hear, has a personal connection to energy efficiency. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, representing Ohio's 9th Congressional District. Let me extend a special thank you to the participants of today's event. The panelists and my colleague, Mr. Fortenberry, are critical allies for inventing and investing in the future. As chair of the Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee, I'm excited to see the connection between our research and development programs and the next generation of deployment. According to E2, there were 3.3 million jobs in clean energy in the United States at the beginning of 2020, and that includes over 2.3 million jobs in energy efficiency. The Department of Energy Programs at the Building Technologies Office and the Weatherization Program offer a window into how the energy efficiency economy can help meet our nation's 21st century challenges. My goal as Chair of Energy and Water is to help our generation assure a better future for those that follow. I'm confident that our country will meet these new age challenges at the dawn of this new era and that the participants on this panel can help guide us into a future of which we all can be proud. Together, we will have to lead the world in the tasks ahead. If we do, the reward will be great. We will build back a better future superior to today's and produce new, good-paying jobs while we're at it. Before I close, let me give a special thanks to the participants and the EESI for organizing today's event. It is a critical opportunity to learn more about the programs and the crucial link that the Department of Energy serves for the energy efficiency economy of tomorrow. Hi, this is Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, and I want to welcome you to the Energy Efficiency Conference. I'm so happy you're interested in this space and interested in investing here. Uh, as we rethink the architecture for the 21st century, politically and economically particularly, it is clear that we need to begin a important transition to a sustainable source of energy in the future. And part of that is conservation and efficiency and innovation. Uh, a number of years ago, when I lost a heating and air system, um, I took myself on a journey. I thought this might be a time where I rethink my own energy needs. And I actually implemented a geothermal system in my own house. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of technologically, uh, technological design, if you will. I used an available tax credit. Uh, my local utility had a rebate. At that time, the equipment manufacturer also had a rebate. And in Nebraska, we have an energy loan program that gives citizens, persons who want to have a low interest loan, uh, the opportunity to upgrade equipment and use new building technologies for the sake of energy efficiency. I'm really happy I did that. We're very pleased with it. It creates a better environment inside the house, uh, obviously saves a huge amount of cost on natural gas. A little bit tough when it gets down to minus 20, like it did last week, where the override electrical system has to kick in. But nonetheless, it was my own small way of trying to participate, by example, in energy efficiency. So I'm really happy that you're bringing a decided emphasis on this. I've long been a supporter, again, of trying to uh, move us 
to a sustainable, renewable-based economy. Obviously, we have to do that in stages so that we're not disruptive. Uh, but at the same time, this is an exciting vision that attracts many, many people because ultimately it's about stewardship of the resources we have. Have a great conference. Well, thank you very much, Representative Kaptur and Representative Fortenberry for joining us today. Uh, of course, we wish we could be with you in person today, but on behalf of everyone at ESI and in our audience today, uh, thank you very much for your leadership as energy efficiency champions. We send you our best wishes to be well, stay safe, and to take care. Let me also take a moment to acknowledge the hard work by your staff in the planning for this briefing. Um, your offices are always awesome to work with, and I consider Matthew and Alan key partners in our work. So thank you, and thanks to your staff. I will let the welcome messages from our hosts do most of the talking this afternoon, but I do have some logistics to share. After our final panelists, we will have time for questions from our online audience. If you have a question, please follow EESI on Twitter at EESI online and send in your questions that way. If you'd rather, you can also send us an email. The email address is EESI at EESI.org. And now to our panelists. We have assembled five leading voices in the practice and business of energy efficiency. One reason why everyone loves energy efficiency is because it has something for everyone. Yes, energy efficiency means business, but it also means so much more. Good jobs, cleaner environment, lower utility bills, a more reliable and resilient energy system, and lower greenhouse gas emissions. And now we are going to hear all about that. Our first panelist is Vicki Hackett. Vicki is the Deputy Commissioner of Energy at the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. She was appointed to this position in August 2019, and as Deputy Commissioner, Vicki is leading DEEP's energy branch as Connecticut transitions to a zero-carbon electric grid. Her responsibilities include developing Connecticut's integrated, integrated resources plan and comprehensive energy strategy, overseeing procurements of clean energy resources, and developing policies and programs in the areas of energy affordability, energy efficiency, and strategic electrification of the transportation and housing sectors to help Connecticut achieve its greenhouse gas reduction goals. Welcome to the panel today, Vicki. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for EESI and for the invitation to join you today and to our hosts, Representatives Captor and Fortenberry and their staff. I'm excited and I'm honored to be here with this panel today. As Dan mentioned, my name is Vicki Hackett. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Energy at the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And I'd like to offer a few insights from Connecticut related to our energy efficiency and other programs, as well as the overarching priorities of all 56 state and territory members of the National Association of State Energy Officials, or NASIO. Um, so I'd like to start, uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. And the next one. Thank you. Uh, with the state energy program, and just a, a quick uh, overview, um, the value of the U.S. state energy program, or SEP, uh, is that it provides Connecticut and all other states uh, uh, in delivering energy savings, improving the resilience and sustainability of our communities, and reducing air pollution, creating jobs, and helping achieve our energy, climate, and resilience goals. The SEP is the only cost-shared program administered by the U.S. Department of Energy that provides resources directly to the states. Uh, the SEP formula funds uh, uh, provide states with the flexibility that they need to meet their unique public and private sector energy efficiency and renewable energy opportunities within a framework that's set by Congress. SEP is not a one-size-fits-all program and instead allows states uh, the flexibility to determine how to meet the goals that Congress sets. States use SEP funds on activities such as preparing for energy emergencies, assisting small businesses and manufacturers with energy efficiency to reduce energy costs, um, improving competitiveness and creating jobs, planning for and investing in electric vehicle infrastructure, and supporting local governments in energy efficiency retrofits of schools, police stations, and other public facilities to reduce utility bills paid by taxpayers. States strategically use SEP funding to leverage private and state investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies and infrastructure with exceptional results. In fact, DOE's Oak Ridge National Laboratory completed a comprehensive evaluation of SEP and found that each dollar of SEP federal funds leverages $10.71 of non-federal funds, and each dollar of SEP federal funds produces annual energy savings of 1.03 million source BTUs 
and cost savings of $7.22. That's one of the best bang for your buck programs available through the federal government. Next slide, please. So I'd like to talk a little bit about um, in, in Connecticut, uh, what's known as our conservation and load management program. Um, we have used uh, SEP funds to support important energy policies and programs um, that are embodied in our conservation and load management program, uh, which contains a portfolio of programs that provide significant energy and cost savings to residents and businesses. And by providing these savings, the CNLM programs reduce emissions from fossil fuel plants, addressing climate, health, and environmental justice concerns. The CNLM programs also add to the gross state product generate tax revenues, and support thousands of good jobs across the state. Next slide, please. So the annual, um, the CNLM plan operates on a three-year planning cycle, and the current plan for uh, 2019 to 2021 is projected to generate lifetime savings of over 71 million MMBTUs and reduce over 575,000 tons of CO, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Next slide, please. Our plan priorities and key themes of the 2019 to 2021 um, CNLM plan are listed on this slide. The plan is also updated annually to incorporate public input and ensure that it stays, it remains aligned with current energy trends and policies. The 2021 plan update was just released this week. The 2021 plan update builds on the priorities and themes listed here while providing additional savings opportunities for residents and businesses, new workforce development opportunities, and an increased focus on community engagement and enhanced commitment to equity and environmental justice. Next, thank you. Uh, so Connecticut has several ongoing projects that are supported by the SEP, and many of them build off our conservation and load management or other uh, uh, programs that we have underway. So um, for example, we have an energy cap program that I'll talk a little bit more about in a bit that tracks utility use and cost in state buildings. Um, we have EV infrastructure and planning um, development that uh, we'll be focusing SEP funding on uh, in, the, in the coming year. Uh, we are looking at ways that we can address uh, barriers to weatherization using uh, potentially using SEP funding. And that really is an equity and environmental justice issue because uh, especially in states with older housing stock, um, such as Connecticut, uh, there could be many barriers to participation in, in our uh, important cost-saving, uh, energy-saving programs. We're looking at uh, in implementing heat pump adoption initiatives to support building decarbonization and supporting um, energy affordability through um, a home energy score and working with realtors and educating them about the value of a home energy score so that people who are uh, buying or renting properties will better understand um, what their energies will be when they move in, what their energy use will be when they move in. Uh, we're also focusing on developing the clean energy workforce through investments and in programs at local community colleges. In 2019, um, DEEP also used SEP funds to make energy efficient uh, LED lighting upgrades at nine state facilities, including eight state parks and our marine headquarters at DEEP, um, saving over $7,000 annually in electricity costs. Next slide, please. So just taking a, a little bit of a deeper dive into one program, DEEP utilizes a web-based software program called Energy Cap to track utility use and costs at all of our state-owned or leased facilities. So DEEP has successfully collected contiguous data for electricity, natural gas, delivered fuels, water, and sewer back to 2018, providing a benchmark from which to measure and analyze energy use and costs for Connecticut state agencies. Energy Cap provides each state agency with the tools to track and manage utility data empowering them to make informed decisions about efficiency investments, which will return the highest savings to investment ratio. Energy cap has been fundamental in the implementation of Governor Lamont's Executive Order 1, which directs executive branch agencies to reduce greenhouse ga gas emissions by 45%, waste disposal by 25%, and water use by 10% by 2030. The software currently houses nearly 4,000 state-owned or leased buildings, while recording use and cost of 11,731 utility meters. With the help of Energy Cap, Connecticut has reduced energy use by 8% since 2018, a savings of over $12 million. And that program is supported by SEP funds. We also had a program in 2017 to 2018. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, thank you. In 2017 to 2018, we used SEP funds to support the installation of a compost aeration heat recovery system at a local Connecticut dairy farm which demonstrates the flexibility of the SCP funding. The system speeds up the production of compost by increasing the rate of aeration while simultaneously capturing waste heat and using it elsewhere on the farm as a space and water heating um, measure. The project was visited by Congressman Joe Courtney in 2018, and the system increased the compost production revenue by $21,000 in the first year of operation and reduced diesel fuel use by 1,400 gallons and over 400 hour, uh, hours of labor savings. Next slide, please. With respect to weatherization barriers, um, there are many residents who can't take advantage of Connecticut's energy efficiency programs, as I mentioned a little while ago, because their homes have a health and safety barrier that prevents weatherization. From 2017 to 2019, 23% of participants in the Home Energy Solutions Income Eligible Program had health and safety barriers that prevented them from um, going to the next level of measures compared to only 9% of market rate participants. Remedi remediating these barriers can be prohibitively expensive. One study found that removing asbestos, one of the most common barriers in Connecticut, can cost an average of over $14,000. DEEP is convening workshops with stakeholders to develop solutions to these barriers, including leveraging additional sources of funding, coordinating with other agencies and services to generate refer referrals for weatherization programs, and improving community engagement strategies. Next slide, please. So another focus that we have for our SEP funding is uh, Connecticut's energy efficiency workforce. Roughly eight in 10 clean energy jobs in Connecticut are, the, are in the energy efficiency sector, which supported over 36,000 jobs in Connecticut in 2019. Unfortunately, the energy efficiency industry suffered some of the greatest job losses during the COVID-19 pan pandemic, in, at least in Connecticut. Over 84% of clean energy jobs lost were in energy efficiency. DEEP worked really closely with the utilities and the energy efficiency contractors to create a plan for a safe return to work and took steps to ramp up business activity, including increasing incentives, which also provide um, a stimulus for customers who participate. And thanks to this hard work, we're seeing a rapid comeback in, in uh, the programs and in hiring. To keep this momentum going, DEEP is exploring strategies to uh, further develop Connecticut's energy efficiency workforce, including collaborating with the Governor's Workforce Council on a variety of initiatives. An evaluation, we're also doing an evaluation of the success of past clean energy workforce initiatives and gathering stakeholder input through uh, our contractor technical advisory committee meetings. Next slide, please. So another opportunity um, potentially for, S for SEP or other funding is um, our microgrids and resilience program. In September 2020, Governor Lamont convened the, Gen the Connecticut General Assembly for a special session that led to the passage of Public, that Public Act 20-5. And Section 6 15 of that act expanded our microgrid program to create a microgrid and resilience grant, grant and loan program, which will also support resilience projects not connected to a microgrid, including those related to climate change. The governor's 2022 to 2023 biannual budget recommends $5 million a year and new bond funds for these projects and federal funding could be leveraged with that funding to do some really critical resilience work in Connecticut. Next slide, please. So um, the public act expanded the allowed uses for the funding from the program to include community planning that includes microgrid or resilience project feasibility, including a cost benefits, benefit analysis, um, assistance uh, for the cost of design and engineering services and interconnection infrastructure for resilience projects, with, which we've seen as a big barrier. Um, resilience projects connected to storage systems or certain distributed energy systems, and also non-federal cost sharing for grant or loan applications for projects or programs that include microgrids or resilience. And the uh, Public Act requires DEEP to prioritize proposals that benefit vulnerable communities and allows DEEP to hire a technical consultant to help implement the program. Next slide, please. I also wanna talk about the Weatherization Assistance Program. Uh, it's a federally funded uh, program from the US Department of Energy that provides weatherization services, critical weatherization services to low-income residents. Benefits include mechanical, um, services such as repair and replace of heating systems and water heaters, installation of programmable, programmable thermostats, and insulating ductwork and water pipes. The building shell, which includes insulating attics and sidewalls, air sealing, repairing and replacing windows and doors, 
And health and, health and safety measures such as testing of heating systems and combustion appliances, ventilation installation, and smoke and carbon uh, uh, monoxide detector installation, um, as well as incidental repairs. Uh, next slide, please. These are some of the statistics showing the benefits of the program nationally and within Connecticut for some of our citizens who are really most impacted by high energy costs in Connecticut. Connecticut is eager to continue this work and urges Congress to fund the U.S. state energy program at 90 million for fiscal year 2022 annual appropriation and to fund the weatherization assistance program at 360 million, which also offers our state residents important energy efficiency and utility cost savings. Next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about um, supporting equity uh, through these programs and through all of our programs um, in energy at Connecticut Deep. So institutionalizing equity in DEEP's energy work is a significant priority of ours, and we're taking steps both internally and externally to ensure that it's reflected across our work, including building an internal equity team uh, to institutionalize equity, diversity, and inclusion within our processes and our culture within DEEP. Um, Within the 2021 Conservation and Load Management Plan update, we created uh, new energy equity metrics, uh, as well as emphasizing uh, reaching low and moderate income customers and planning to address renter barriers to weatherization and more. Uh, within our integrated resources plan, we had a wide range of recommendations that address affordability um, and lessen the uh, that recommendations related to environmental impacts to marginalized groups improving residents' access to behind-the-meter resources, and more. Um, we also, in Connecticut, uh, the governor, uh, Governor Lamont signed on to the MOU for the Transportation Climate Initiative Program, capping the transportation-related emissions of our largest uh, uh, emitting sector, um, prioritizing at least 35% of the clean reinvestments in overburdened and underserved communities and establishing an equity advisory board. We're also supporting new legislation codifying the zero carbon electric supply target by 2040 that we have and requiring home energy labeling or in the alternative uh, provision of the last 12 months of utility bills um, for when, when a property owner lists a, a home for sale or rent to provide transparency, which we believe is the first step toward affordability. Next slide, please. We also have underway uh, an equitable energy efficiency proceeding at DEEP that we launched in September to help define equity in the context of our energy efficiency programs and increase participation in these programs, particularly in underserved communities. Next slide, please. So we support uh, NASIO's funding requests, as stated earlier, for the U.S. state energy program of 90 million for the fiscal year 2022 annual appropriation and for the weatherization assistance program of 360 million. And we also support NASIO's SCP funding request under a stimulus or infrastructure package at 3.1 billion. The administration has called for retrofitting 4 million buildings and 2 million low-income homes and the installation of 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations across the country. Connecticut Deep and our state energy office colleagues across the country have a proven track record with implementing results-driven public-private partnership program areas such as these. Under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, SCP was funded at $3.1 billion, and Connecticut Deep and other state energy offices use these funds to create jobs, improve residential, commercial, and industrial efficiency, support the first wave electric, of electric vehicle investments, and enhance the resilience of our energy infrastructure. We appreciate Chair Chairwoman Captors and Congressman Fortenberry's strong support of both of the state energy program and the weatherization assistance program. And as Congress considers expanded energy efficiency, renewable energy, climate, and resilience uh, activities, we urge recognition of the need to support both energy R&D and important demonstration and deployment projects such as SEP, which speed the movement of energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies from labs into the marketplace. Um, NASIO and many state energy offices have worked to expand energy efficiency in other areas in partnership with federal agencies, for example, NASIO has strongly supported agricultural renewable energy and energy efficiency programs accomplished through the energy title of the multi-year farm bill. Programs such as USDA's REAP provide funding to farmers and ranchers to help on energy efficiency and renewable energy. And these are the types of programs that directly benefit uh, Nebraska consumers, for example. In addition to uh, forward year 20 2022 regular 
federal appropriations, NASIO also supports some innovative ideas that could be done through a stimulus or reconciliation bill or through an energy SEP and infrastructure package. In addition to the SEP program, uh, Representative Blunt Rochester has introduced the Open Back Better Bill, um, which would provide federal funds through the state energy offices to address resilience upgrades at mission critical facilities like schools and hospitals and facilitate private financing for cost efficient, cost effective energy efficiency and renewable energy improvements. And finally, it's worth noting that the state energy offices with support of SEP funding have rapidly and effectively developed policies and implemented programs to alleviate energy burden on individuals and businesses that resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic. SEP dollars enabled states to develop and implement emergency plans that literally kept the lights on in the early days of the pandemic. Annual SEP funding and enhanced funding through a stimulus infrastructure package would enable state energy offices to build on these important activities and reduce energy costs for low-income households and small businesses, launch energy efficiency and infrastructure programs that would create jobs, and improve the resilience of our energy infrastructure to get America back to work. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to taking questions. Thank you so much, Vicki, for your presentation. Um, you mentioned NASIO a lot, National Association of State Energy Officials. Um, great resource. We always open, or for four years, we've opened this briefing with a state energy office representative. It's difficult to tell the story of energy policy in the United States and energy efficiency in particular without uh, starting with the state energy offices. If you're not already to our staff and our, and our audience today, if you're not already using NASIO as a resource, it's a great, great resource to learn exactly what's happening in your state. I am a state energy office alumnus. I did six years at the Maryland Energy Administration, and I started at the last stimulus and was part of that. And there's just no better way to to, to get in the, you know, to, to, to make a difference in energy policy than uh, working in your energy office. So thank you so much, Vicki, for start uh, for um, kicking off our panel today. Um, there was a lot of information in Vicki's slides, and so I just wanted to have a quick reminder that if you missed any of it, and this goes for all of our remaining panelists, we archive everything uh, online at www.eesi.org. You can view the webcast, you can see the slides, and uh, over the next couple, couple days, we'll also have written summaries as well, so that you can quickly find the information that you want. Um, and uh, of course, it's all free and, and widely available. Uh, now I get to introduce our second panelist. Christopher D. Hess is Vice President of Global Public Affairs for Eaton, a global power management company that serves customers in more than 175 countries. Chris works cross-functionally with Eaton businesses to develop the company's strategic position on global regulatory, legislative, and government issues. Chris advises Eaton stakeholders on complex global policy issues, including but not limited to aerospace, defense, energy, trade, taxation, and government programs and procurement. Chris, it is great to see you again. Thank you for once again joining our energy efficiency panel, and I will turn it over to you. So Dan, thank you again for inviting me back. Um, I'm just thinking about how the world has changed since we last met last January in the pandemic and how it has really accelerated the way we communicate, the way we work and energy uh, is no different. We are seeing a huge investment and focus on energy transition. The pandemic kind of gave us a sense of you know, how our supply chains are critical, how we manage our power and the availability of power are gonna be critical to our economy, but also making sure that um, the people that we employ and that are in our communities are getting what they need to, to address these issues, but also to uh, live uh, more healthy lives. So Eaton is positioning ourselves to, to chase and to address a lot of these issues related to climate change, because we see tremendous growth opportunities to provide solutions for these um, different initiatives. And we can go to the next slide. So if, if you think about Eaton Corporation, I, I would say that we're, we're providing intelligent power management systems in anything that moves, really. Electrical power through power distribution and management of, of, of buildings and data centers and residential homes. Uh, also the, um, the incorporation of renewables into the grid and into different uh, facilities, but in, in aircraft um, and also in, in vehicles through our vehicle business. And now in our new segment, e-mobility, which is focused on taking our 100 years of expertise in power management 
and driving that through the vehicle. So we're really excited about the opportunities for Eaton, but we're so engaged in identifying the right partners so that we can innovate to address these issues, solve problems for our customers, and address some of the societal challenges that we, we foresee um, in the next several years and decades. So energy transition is efficiency, but it's also resiliency, sustainability, and reliability. And those are the things that we're really focused on. We've had a great opportunity to partner with a lot of the members of these committees that are in charge of authorizing and appropriating dollars for energy. We have uh, facilities in 25 uh, states throughout the country. We have a wonderful footprint of manufacturing and research and operations in uh, many of the congressional districts that are represented on these committees, worked with a lot of the staff and members, have a great uh, unique relationship with Congresswoman Capture in the fact that we're global operations are in Cleveland, Ohio, which includes portions of her congressional district, and really appreciate her leadership in terms of bringing um, a focused innovation on energy to uh, Northwest and Northeast Ohio. So I really enjoy working with them. And we have a tremendous amount of assets in Nebraska as well in our vehicle business that uh, we, are, we are innovating to make internal combustion engines more efficient, reduce emissions, but we're also very much aligned with this e-mobility trend. Um, so again, thanks to them for, for co-hosting this event once again. Can go to the next slide, please. So my focus is really gonna be um, demonstrating how a company partners with the Department of Energy and the federal government to invest and innovate and what those collaborations mean for a company like Eaton so that we're focused on the right types of innovations, but also leveraging the resources of the federal government, bringing our own unique perspectives and technical competencies to bear, but finding collaborations with both nonprofit and profit customers so that we can come together and really identify how to address these, um, these challenges that, that the market is facing. And if you look at the different offices of in, in ERE, we, we are playing in every single one of those. We have examples of, of programs that we're, we're leading and partners in that um, are helping guide our innovation process as we try to address the energy transition and climate action initiatives uh, in the United States. So this is a global uh, scope in terms of a competition. So DOE is, is vital for the United States. The investments in DOE and the programs are gonna help the United States uh, maintain their lead on the technical side, but also deployment is, was just as critical. The, from a pilot program that takes an innovation to the market and demonstrates its real world application and improves things to fleets and, and building managers that these things not only work, that they, they, they are more uh, efficient and have cost savings in them, but they provide more productivity. I mean, these are the home runs of things that we're trying to, to, to bring to the market. So through programs like SEP or the creative programs like EECBG that were in the last stimulus program, so important to deploy these technologies. And you can, you can really target areas um, that are in a, in a sense, um, in areas of underemployment or underinvestment through these localized funds because they're localized decisions in a very specific manner. So I think if we're looking at stimulus or recovery funding in the future, these are great ways to make sure that these, these areas of underutilization and the, and the areas that are maybe being impacted by climate issues more, um, more significantly are able to access the money and then address their unique issues and their unique circumstances. So let's go to the next slide. This is just one example you know, of a program that we did with the DOE Solar Office. Um, and you know, from our perch in, in Cleveland, Ohio, we're leveraging our facilities in, in the Pittsburgh area, in uh, Milwaukee and Wisconsin, but also our facilities in Oregon and um, facilities in Virginia. But we're bringing in other partners and we're partnering with utilities and, and fleets and customers and talking about how can we, how are we leveraging you know, all of these different uh, DOE labs that, that provide so many critical resources that we can't duplicate as a company? 
we can we can never come close to the investments that they're making in the labs and in modeling and research. And it really accelerates our ability to bring innovations to market. And all of the university systems that we're collaborating with, both with our own investments, our own recruitment, but also in, in promoting technology development. Cer certainly also, you know, cross agency and cross department investments in the federal government, DOE, DOD, and uh, the Department of Transportation and others. So these collaborations are critical to the success of company like Eaton, but I think it's also providing something to the Department of Energy and the US government in terms of leveraging, leveraging these critical dollars that uh, you get more bang for the buck there. Next slide, please. This is just a, um, an example of the different labs that a company like Eaton is engaged with. And it's basically every single lab uh, in the DO, uh, DOE portfolio. Very hard to read, this is sort of a eye chart here. But as you see, like when we, we're, we're looking to collaborate within the lab network, their, you know, their understanding of Eaton's technologies and our ability to, to really tap into their resources is critical for our future growth and our future innovation. And um, we've got dozens of programs over the last decade that have gone from, um, from a lab into the marketplace, in, into the power management systems um, on the grid or in, in facilities, into vehicles through programs like uh, the 21st Century Truck Program or, or the, um, the, you know, the, the next generation of the vehicles that are both heavy duty and light duty. And we're even taking some of our competencies on the electrical management side and driving them into the aerospace industry because we're electrifying everything. Electrification promotes not only efficiency and cost savings, but it prom promotes digitalization and artificial intelligence. So most of the smart um, controls are gonna be electric. And the DOE investments in these labs over the next decade are really gonna be key to making sure that the United States is keeping up and in, in leading in these areas and these technologies as we go forward. So the next slide, please. One of, the, one of the great relationships that we have going back about four years now is our relationship with NREL in Colorado. The National Renew Renewable Energy Lab has world-class facilities um, and, and, and they're helping us um, promote our energy integration uh, systems that are deployed in data centers, in buildings, and mission critical environments that, that, need, that, that need to be sustained in order for us to make sure that our country has the power when it needs it. Um, we have 15 PhD researchers embedded in the facility. So instead of having them set up a meeting that you, you can't, you know, you gotta go through, you know, through all the, the arrangements to get there, we, go, we were going down the hall. This was last year before the pandemic. Now we're working with them virtually, looking forward to perhaps in the near future getting back together in the facility. But it was really a great demonstration of how the private sector and the, um, the, the labs are working together to promote faster adoption of some of the um, you know, energy efficient and sustainable products that we're really focused on. Next slide, please. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the key segments of growth and, and mega trends that we're seeing and one that was accelerated, frankly, by the, the, the pandemic, not only from seeing what, it, what needs to be done in terms of um, mitigating climate change, but really getting focused companies focused on growth and the future. And that's what economic downturns do. They really focus companies on how to address future challenges because resource, resources become scarce. So you really have to focus. So you've heard a lot of OEMs announcing all you know, their electrification efforts. Eaton has done the same thing. We have been engaged in this for, for over 15 years. And this is just an example of a program where we're, we're part of a subcontractor with EPRI and working with utilities um, and different OEMs and even the, the um, uh, DOE programs of clean cities to not only uh, demonstrate the technology, but deploy it throughout the country. So we're, we're excited. This is one kind of program we could never duplicate on our own, but having the Department of Energy funded in the right areas, having the right oppor funding opportunity announcements, targeted at the right things is really gonna be critical as we move forward. So we, 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 we are excited about the opportunities of these programs bring, that, they, that they bring. Next slide, please. 
I think um, over the past um, several years, there, there's been a focus on early stage uh, technology and innovation development, and, and perhaps it's the job of the private sector to commercialize. And, and what we would say at Eaton is that it's just important to be in that those TRLs uh, six through 10, where we're trying to get these products to market through the, in it, through the programs of DOE, focusing on how to demonstrate the capabilities of these new technologies have for our customers and for the market. You know, if, if you're dealing with a truck fleet or a building, their number one priority is to get goods to market or to, to ensure the operations of their facilities. And there is a definite sort of debt valley of debt there if we can't demonstrate these, these technologies to the satisfaction of the end market so that they can be ad adopted. There is, there is no scenario where a truck can be on the side of the road because the new technology doesn't work. So these programs that, that pilot and demonstrate all of these new technologies are just important as the, the early stage innovation that's taking place at DOE. And we would just stress that we wanna focus on all of these opportunities to make sure that all these investments are making their way into the marketplace. Next slide, please. And finally, I, we're, we're having a conversation today, right? It's not just talking to you, telling you how great Eaton is. We, we think we're great, right? But we're trying to get better. But how can we work better together to, um, to leverage the resources and take advantage of the opportunities that we might have in a recovery act to really accelerate the, the um, impact that DOE has on our economy and our competitiveness as a country? And looking at the opportunities to, to focus on cross-cutting technology platforms through different programs that bring different parties together in unique ways. There's a, there's a model in Europe where, where there, there is um, competitors all together in one program, and they're working on technology uh, challenges as opposed to working on specific products that are unique to each of those companies. So we're working together in a way that tries to solve a platform issue, right? As opposed to a unique circumstance with, within a company. So the whole economy can benefit from that research. If, you know, and that's maybe a model that we could maybe take a look at. So we're bringing that you know, to the forefront here. Um, I cannot read that slide. Is there a way we can blow that up a little bit? I just wanna make sure I, I, I hit these key points. You know, on the vehicle side, we, we hear about the electrification of the, of the passenger vehicle market and certainly exciting new developments and investments are being made by the OEMs. A lot of new aggressive investments in deployment of infrastructure to, to charge those vehicles, um, not only uh, you know, in, you know, efficiently, but also incorporating renewable opportunities. And in the future, and, you know, the ability to store energy and get that back on the grid in when it's which mo when it's most utilized. But in the heavy duty space, we've got a lot of different segments in about fifteen thousand different duty cycles, and we need tech with technologies that fit those duty cycles. So all electric doesn't work in every every segment. Fuel cells may be a solution in the class eight sections. In a lot of the different um, class six and seven ones where you're doing urban delivery, maybe it's a plug-in hybrid or an electrified drivetrain. Um, all these things are different. So it's to, to be flexible and provide flexibility in programs that bring the right, mar the, the, the right technologies to market and don't miss opportunities to drive efficiency. Um, I, again, on the aerospace side, a lot of opportunities for, for electrifying aircraft and use, utilizing the same platforms in the other spaces to really drive a new industry. So maybe a collaboration through FAA and the Department of Transportation and the DOE. And then as we look forward, the electrical opportunities are just tremendous. A micro grid deployment, um, digitalization of everything, electrification of everything provides smart data to utilize to be more productive and to provide more value for customers um, and to consumers. And you know, Eaton's very, very excited about these developments and these opportunities. So we're, we're steering our ship to the, in these directions and hope to be part of the solution as we move forward. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and I'm looking forward to hear from the rest of the panel. Thanks so much, Chris, for your presentation today. Um, and uh, welcome back to the panel. Uh, it's great to see you.
Uh, our third panelist uh, is Arjun Krishnaswamy. He is an analyst with the Natural Resources Defense Council's Climate and Clean Energy Program. He leverages modeling and analysis to support policy solutions to accelerate the clean energy transition, focusing on policy in the Western states and at the federal level. Uh, previously, he was a Schneider Fellow at NRDC, where he focused on promoting energy efficiency and renewable energy through legislation, as well as Department of Energy Innovation Programs. He has two degrees, a bachelor's degree in environmental science, uh, environmental systems engineering, and a master's in civil and environmental engineering, both from Stanford University. Welcome to the panel. Uh, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say today. It's great to see you. And you have maybe the best background of all of us. It's definitely the greenest. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> and thank you, ESI, for inviting us to join the conversation today. Uh, I'm excited to, to talk to you all about the importance of appropriations and the federal budget for DOE uh, in it, advancing solutions to address the climate crisis, building out energy efficiency solutions and uh, the clean energy economy. Um, so on, on the first slide, uh, let's see, on the first slide, you'll see um, some of the, the key points I wanna talk to you all about today. Um, and you know some of the, the other panelists have, have talked and will talk about the amazing projects that DOE has funded and the type, the, the really specific type of work that brings, uh, brings the benefits of DOE funding to, to, uh, to communities and to businesses. And I want to take it a little bit higher level and talk about why in this moment it's so important to have uh, bold increases in the budget for, uh, for these DOE programs. And in particular, talk about first the success stories that we've seen, how, how uh, DOE funding has driven some of the the amazing transformation we've seen in clean energy to date, uh, and then talk about why, uh, why these programs are underfunded relative to the need and the opportunity. Um, and then finally, talk about what the opportunities are for really big, uh, bold increases in the FY22 budget and beyond. Um, so on the, on the next slide, you'll see uh, two charts that really illustrate this first point, that we've seen a transformation of the clean energy space uh, that that is is really you know we can tie to in part DOE investments and uh, th that story is that the cost of some of our major clean energy solutions uh, has dramatically declined in the last decade or so from sixty to ninety five percent for uh, solar wind EV batteries and LED bulbs and uh, that's a result of decades of federal investment in in R and D as well as uh, tax incentives and other federal policies and state policies that have driven this, the, these cost reductions and, and the growth you see on the other chart, which is really you know, exponential for LED bulbs and, and electric vehicles and, and uh, a really fast growth trajectory for, for wind and solar. So uh, on, on the next slide, you'll see you know, there's uh, several other reasons why DOE programs have been so impactful. Uh, the, the bullets on, on the right side of the screen show uh, just some of the other metrics that that are really really impressive for these these DOE programs. Uh, an independent peer reviewed evaluation of uh, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy showed that for every dollar invested in uh, through these programs, thirty three dollars of benefits accrued to the public, which is which is an enormous return on on investment uh, from from federal dollars and. That study looked particularly as well at uh, investments in HVAC, water heating, and appliance R&D uh, through the Building Technologies Office and found that the benefits are uh, up to $66 per dollar invested through these programs for, for the subset of programs that, that they looked at, which again is, is uh, a really uh, incredible use of, of federal dollars to, to bring benefits to people. And those benefits are beyond just improvements in, in technology cost or, uh, or growth in the technologies, they also enable and improve the other solutions we have on hand to address climate change. Uh, the investments that DOE has made in, in appliance R&D have helped the appliance standard program uh, do even more and be even stronger to bring cost savings and energy savings to more people. And the same is true uh, for the renewable energy investments and, and state RPS policies, for example. Um, and then a, a word about the Weatherization Assistance Program, which is, you know, as Vicky, Vicky mentioned, it's a really critical program for uh, bringing the benefits of energy efficiency to low-income households. And it also has 
uh, enormous economic benefits too, in terms of job creation, uh, saving saving households money on their energy bills. Um, and you know the the other component of this slide is just a, a chart that shows the budget for ERE and the great increases that we've seen over the last several years, thanks to uh, thanks to a bipartisan set of appropriators that have uh, protected these programs, acknowledged their importance, and uh, and made them more robust uh, over the last few years. And we hope to see see that progress continue, as I'll, I'll talk about. So on the next slide, um, you know. Though we've seen amazing success come out of these, these programs at ERE and DOE more broadly, we also know that we're missing out on opportunities uh, by not having those budgets uh, be significantly larger than they are today. And the chart here shows funding for DOE's uh, energy programs uh, in, in FY, I believe that's FY21. Uh, and that's about you know, a little over $10 billion. Uh, if you compare that to what the funding would have been, if these programs had grown, the budget for these programs had grown with inflation, uh, the, the budget would be closer to $32 billion, so significantly larger than, than what we're spending today. And that's that first line on the chart. And the, the second line is the amount of money that we would be spending through DOE uh, clean energy programs if we were to meet uh, President Biden's commitment to spend $400 billion over 10 years uh, on energy innovation. Uh, so again, we're, we're a, a through these DOE programs, we're a bit far away from meeting those goals, and there's a lot of room to increase these programs with with bold increases to the budget to reach them. Uh, but moreover, even you know beyond the goals that we're trying to reach, uh, in addition to these, of course, the, the other goals related to retrofitting um, two million buildings, building 1.5 million efficient affordable housing uh, units. Uh, uh, beyond those goals, there's also opportunities we're missing uh, just by by not being able to fund more qualified applicants uh, through existing programs at DOE. Uh, for example, the, there was a recent funding opportunity where uh, DOE could only fund 4% of the applicants that applied. And a lot of the data on, on the number of, that, of applicants that apply is not public, but we understand that there's a lot of qualified applicants who are applying to these programs or are interested in them, uh, who we could be funding with, with greater, greater budgets for these programs. Um, similarly, the Weatherization Assistance Program uh, is enormously successful for the households that it uh, it can reach, but it only reaches a, a fraction of a percent of the eligible households each year. And it, in fact, you know, if, if we were to keep the weatherization assistance program funded at the same level for the next four years, it would reach about 150,000 households out of 40 million, or uh, well, more than 40 million, really, that are are eligible. Um, so, so there's a, a big opportunity here that we're missing out on. On the next slide, you can see that not only are DOE, these DOE clean energy programs uh, underfunded in general compared to the need, they're also uh, particularly underfunded for the energy using sectors where uh, energy efficiency is, is a core solution. Uh, for buildings, industry, and transportation, um, the funding is, is a smaller share of DOE's investments uh, compared to how important these these sectors are for addressing uh, addressing CO2 emissions, uh, which is what this chart shows. Uh, but they're also uh, underfunded relative to the importance of these sectors in advancing some of our other goals, like environmental justice and energy justice and equity. We know that building out a healthy, affordable, efficient housing stock is critical to meeting our equity and energy justice goals, as is building out affordable and accessible mobility systems uh, and industrial and industrial sector that that doesn't pollute nearby communities. And uh, we're really, you know, there's a lot of room to be investing in, in addressing these problems uh, that we're missing out on without a significantly larger budget. So on the next slide, that leads me to uh, really the, the, the big point I want to make, which is the, the time is right for us to uh, to be making bold investments through through programs like those at DOE's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. And uh, you know, we've talked a bit about stimulus investments here, and, and I think uh, there's a role for both large stimulus investments in an infrastructure package, which we really need to get the economy uh, back in gear and to get clean energy workers back to work. And there's also a need for us to get the, the budget for these programs uh, on the track to, to uh, 
you know, expanded for the long term so that we can provide consistent investments in, uh, in building out the clean energy economy and addressing these, these problems that we're facing down. And this chart shows an illustrative uh, increase to DOE's research development uh, and demonstration programs and some other work within the applied energy programs uh, that would, uh, would match President Biden's commitment to $400 billion over 10 years. So uh, just to show the, the types of increases we're talking about and, and the need to really uh, invest more in, in these funding opportunities. On the next slide, um, I wanna talk a, a bit about some of the specific opportunities. What are we talking about? Which, which of course, some of, some of my co-panelists have, have dug into. And um, I'll talk a bit about the Building Technologies Office and the Advanced Manufacturing Office. Um, these slides just show, or these charts just show uh, the current distribution of funding in both of these offices. So for BTO, uh, the main, the main uh, places, of, uh, the main categories of funding are the residential and commercial buildings integration programs, uh, emerging technologies, and the codes and standards work, all of which are, uh, have, have opportunities to expand and places where they could be even more impactful. And, and just a few to highlight uh, for RBI and CBI, these, these programs are, of course, critical to bringing the, uh, the benefits of energy efficiency to, to more places, re re removing the barriers to energy efficiency adoption and taking advanced technologies and helping uh, more people get access to them. And that work, uh, as we know, needs to expand considerably in order for us to, uh, to meet our goals. So there's a lot of room to increase funding for those programs, uh, as well as uh, in the codes and standards program, which we know is a, a cornerstone of the federal a federal efficiency policy, uh, there's a great need to expand that work as well, particularly in uh, in the building energy codes program to uh, bring bring code adoption and compliance uh, to more places through technical assistance, uh, training, and uh, and other resources to support state and local entities. Uh, and there's lots of other exciting opportunities like investing in the grid integrated uh, efficient buildings. Uh, work which really needs funding across RBI and CBI and, and the Emerging Technologies Program, uh, as well as funding to reduce the, the life cycle impacts of, of, of buildings and get at the embodied carbon problem. So lots of, of opportunities to invest more through BTO. And then on the AMO front, uh, the Advanced Manufacturing Office invests in so, mu so many uh, uh, cool projects and important projects that, that we need, uh, including clean energy manufacturing, which are the blue wedges in this chart, uh, industrial efficiency, which are the the orange and red wedges, and uh, materials research and development, those those yellow wedges, and all of this work uh, is is critical and merits uh, merits expansion. But a few areas where you know there's a particular need for more funding, we know that we need to build out efficient, clean uh, manufacturing of clean energy uh, in order to meet our our climate goals, the level of of clean energy deployment that we need. Uh, and to build a stronger clean energy economy here. Um, we also know on the industrial efficiency front that we really have to expand, uh, expand both efficiency at industrial facilities as well as some of these other solutions like uh, electrification or uh, low, low emissions heat. And uh, that work merits significant expansion, especially in the demonstration, in the demonstration uh, and technical assistance lane. So on the, uh, on the next slide, talk a bit about some of the the important work uh, to, to expand assistance to state, tribal, and local governments. Uh, and, and I think my co-panelists have this pretty well covered, but I just wanna say that it's one of the critical pieces of, of the work that DOE does is supporting states and uh, local entities to be stronger climate champions, to deploy clean energy and energy efficiency, to help build out a, a, a more equitable uh, clean energy economy and that work needs not only large stimulus investments, but also uh, for the budget, annual budget for these programs to really increase to the point where it can be supporting year after year those entities uh, in a really meaningful way. And then on the, on the next slide, finally, uh, you know, there's a really important need for more funding for uh, equity, justice, and workforce, develop workforce development activities at DOE. And we know this is a goal for the administration. We know this is a goal for many of us in the in the community, um, and what a key part of this will be ensuring that DOE and other agencies are well resourced to do this work, to properly incorporate analysis, uh, tool development, new criteria, 
and community engagement to bring more people into DOE investment processes, to more communities, um, and to be able to target funding in a way that uh, that will will advance our, our equity goals. Uh, that also means providing increased funding that is specifically to address uh, equity and environmental justice, like, uh, for example, providing funding to the Building Technologies Office to uh, for activities that can, can get at uh, high energy burden communities or communities with high levels of energy poverty um, and to specifically target those issues, as well as funding for uh, programs like the Weatherization Assistance Program. Um, and then on the, the final slide, I'll just leave you with um, just bringing this back to the, the clean energy economy and the fact that, you know, uh, as, as Representative Kaptur mentioned, there were 3.4 million people working in the clean energy economy, most of whom work on energy efficiency before the pandemic. And 400, 430,000 of those people are still out of work due to the pandemic. Uh, so we have a big need for investments in, in stimulus to get, get uh, the economy back going. But we also have a need and an opportunity to, uh, through, through the, the federal budget and the long-term federal budget, uh, grow the clean energy economy, uh, make it work for more people, and, uh, and, and help build the, the clean energy future that we need. Uh, I'll leave it there and, and say thanks again uh, for, for uh, having us and look forward to the, dis the discussion. Great. Well, thanks so much, Arjun. It's great to see you. And I really appreciate that not only did you get the memo about a sweater and a collared men's shirt, but you also followed through on it. So uh, thanks to you as well as Chris for, for doing that. It's, the, um, it's almost like it's the official wardrobe of these briefings, at least on, on the part of, of men. So thanks for that. Um, we are going to turn to our fourth speaker, uh, who is uh, uh, Jennifer Schaefer. Sh Jennifer is the president of Cascade Associates, which is a government affairs uh, consulting firm based in Washington, D.C. And today, Jennifer is appearing as executive director of the Federal Performance Contracting Coalition, uh, which is focused on accelerating the pace, easing the approval process, and increasing the number of federal performance contracts within the federal government. Jennifer has more than 25 years of public policy experience in energy and environmental issues. And she began working with Ted Stevens, Senator Ted Stevens of Alaska, and she's also been a consultant to the Department of Energy. Jennifer, welcome to the briefing today, and I look forward to your presentation. <laughs> um, I think my job today is to do federal energy. So I'm going to talk more about the government's efforts to lead by example performance contract, energy service companies that do performance contracting for the federal government. These are our members. I'm going to just sort of tell you what performance contracting is. That's a very large piece of federal around energy efficiency uh, right now with the federal government. Um, so uh, I'll get broader and narrow as we go along. Um, so our members enter into performance contracting uh, and are um, on a IDIQ contract to do work with the feds. And what that does is an alternative contracting mechanism where the ESCO, the energy service company, designs, builds, actually funds all the infrastructure up front, enters into a contract with the federal government over the long term, and gets paid back out of guaranteed energy savings from utility bill reductions, whether that's water or energy bill reductions. So utility savings pay back the energy service company who puts up the money up front for new infrastructure. So that's just um, a thing, and it's a big way that we get more efficient and install renewables in the federal government. Uh, next slide. Performance contracting, and in fact, everything that FEMP does is growing. The federal energy program uh, and, and RIP large with the government is growing because we're trying to do more. Agencies have a lot more requirements. They don't just want to get more efficient with their energy and water use. They want to install renewables. They want to have resiliency and microgrids. They want to address climate emissions um, and get major reductions. They want to do net zero. They have to be cyber secure. So we're trying to put a lot into how we deliver um, to the federal government from the private sector, whether that's with performance contracting or EPAs or other ways to deliver um, energy systems for the feds. Next slide. Our appropriations requests are being um, driven a little bit from Energy Policy Act of 2020 at the end of the year. There were some changes. 
one of the things that happened is the Federal Energy Management Program at DOE was authorized. Um, that is the program in EERE that helps all federal agencies get more efficient, resilient, and secure. Uh, they advise and facilitate installing zero efficiency emissions vehicles, how, they, how agencies can reduce emissions better. Clearly, they're very busy right now with the direction of the government under the climate um, executive order that was put out about a month ago now. Um, so um, the other things, a few other changes in the bill um, will need to be implemented by DOE. So there's just a lot for them to do. Um, next slide, please. We are requesting that the FEMP program at DOE be funded at the authorized level of $36 million. This was a very carefully orchestrated authorization. It wasn't a really big one. In fact, the budget for FEMP was $36 million under the Bush administration um, and has been lower than that ever since. Um, that program, as I said, helps all federal agencies with technical assistance, with oversight, those types of things on a variety of federal energy issues. It also provides, and this is something that the Committee on uh, Energy and Water Appropriations Committee in the House has initiated, spends about $2 million a year on helping states and localities with their performance contracting work. Um, really just transferring the knowledge base that FEMP has into usable knowledge for schools, hospitals, and other entities like that. We are encouraging another $2 million out of that, out of the base budget for that. Additionally, we're asking for $20 million for something called the Affect Grant Program, assisting federal facilities with energy conservation technologies. It's a thing. Um, it was started under the Obama administration with some of their own funding, very small amounts. And since 20, uh, 2019, it's been funded by Congress. And the whole deal with that program is a little bit of money to leverage big performance contracting. This gets back to the whole, we're all being asked to do more. Can you get me resilience? Can you do net zero? I gotta have everything be cyber secure. Whereas some things we have enough energy and water savings to pay for under a performance contract, we may be able to do the renewable generation, but maybe we can't quite pay for the entire battery backup for that microgrid. The Affect Grant Program would allow for that sort of leverage, um, and it uh, is a 10 to 1 at least program right now. So 10 private dollars being invested in the federal government for every dollar that comes out of the Affect Program. Next slide, please. We have other agency requests, and since this is appropriations, I didn't know how much it was specifically ENW, but when you're talking about the government's own use of energy, um, we have to think more broadly. One of the things that's been a real difficulty over the last few years is execution agencies, entities within agencies at the Army, Navy, Air Force, GSA, VA, they do not have money to execute energy programs in a way that you know is sufficient. Even if they don't have to fund energy programs, they just have to do it with a variety of other tools. They don't have the ability to even staff up on contracting and technical oversight and the job they have to do to negotiate contracts. So that's important and we're gonna pursue that very, very strongly. We support funding at GSA that's akin to what Affect is, and that's something that the committee, um, Financial Services Subcommittee added in 2021, and we support that again. And we're also advocating for a similar Affect-like program at DOD. More than half of performance contracts are at DOD. They have more than half the facilities. They are the biggest landowner in the world and they just have a lot of buildings. So um, we're gonna try to get funding for them to do, um, do more in the energy space and be able to leverage in critical infrastructure along the lines of Open Back Better, something that um, was mentioned at the very beginning. Um, next slide. So that was sort of base appropriations. One of the things we're also doing is requesting stimulus money. Um, that might be in a reconciliation, an incremental appropriation, a, you know, infrastructure. Um, ARA provided funding directly to federal agencies to do clean energy projects. Um, 
we would suggest that if that should happen again uh, through GSA, DOD, DOE, whatever it might be, that we use some of that money to leverage private sector financing to get more. So, um, you know, in ARA, we gave the GSA $5 billion to do efficiency and renewable projects. Great, they got $5 billion worth of projects. If they'd had 1 billion of that had to be leveraged with performance contracting, they'd get more like, you know, 10, 20, 20 15 maybe, billion dollars worth of work in the federal government, worth of projects, worth of investment, worth of infrastructure. So that's important. Um, Last slide, I wanted to just touch on a couple quick things about um, jobs and, and um, missions. So doing retrofit projects in big buildings creates about nine, nine and a half jobs uh, per million dollar of investment. So direct investment of billions of dollars by the federal government gets you a good number of jobs. Um, doing it with performance contracting will be a major multiplier. So instead of getting almost 50,000 jobs, you'll get more like 250 to 500,000 jobs. Um, then the amount of investment goes up, the amount of work goes up, and the amount of uh, clean, green infrastructure goes up. Also on CO2, I just wanted to say that um, Energy efficiency has a big role to play in emissions reductions. Arjun talked about this to some extent. Um, just focusing on little old performance contracting with no incremental money over the last 20 years, and most of the investment of that 7.5 billion private sector money over the last 20 years, about mm, two thirds of it was probably over the last seven years. A lot more work being done lately than had been done a long time ago as we got used to these kinds of things. Um, anyway, that seven and a half billion is reducing CO2 equivalent by seven billion pounds annually. It's the equivalent of taking three uh, coal-fired power plants offline every year. So it does have some impact there. Um, and I think I will leave it there and look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, great presentation. Um, we, uh, in case we are a little short on the back end for questions, I just had a quick follow up. Most of your presentation dealt with FEMP, which is focused on the federal government. But what happens in the performance contracting industry at the federal level also supports federal or performance contracting at the state and local level. Would you be willing to share a little bit about sort of how sort of the industry works outside of the federal government as well, um, in terms of you know, with the under the con with the concept of you know, increasing the leverage of performance contracting even more? So, yeah, there's a whole market of performance contracting outside of the federal market, um, state, local, schools, hospitals, municipalities, et cetera, do performance contracting. Um, the federal market is about a billion dollars a year. The state and local market is bigger than that. It's about $6 billion a year. Not every state does it. All states have different rules. That's one of the reasons the FEMP work with states is so important. They're not, FEMP really isn't authorized to do work on state stuff, but they do this collaborative to help transfer information and really sort of help train the trainers and that type of thing. So um, there is an effort in Open Back Better, um, which is a bill that was introduced on Tuesday. And it was also included in the Clean Futures Act uh, this would be, of course, in a stimulative environment. Um, there's funding that would go through states to leverage performance contracting at the local level, as well as funding through affect that would leverage performance contracting at the federal level. Rules are different in all places. Um, it's it's uh, and the federal projects tend to be bigger and more comprehensive. Um, it's just because of the nature of how they're done, but um, yeah, they're in both places, and they're a really good way to just get more for the federal dollar or the state dollar. Thanks. I really appreciate that a um, little bit of extra there. I appreciate that a lot. Um, we are going to turn to our fifth panelist, um, and he is um, perhaps the Cal Ripken Jr. run of energy efficiency briefings. He never misses a start. He's going four for four in briefing appearances. 
True Iron Man, Curtis Zimmerman, Manager, Government Liaison at BASF Corporation. His work today focuses on DOE, especially ARPA-E, the National Labs, as well as the Defense Department. Curtis has managed work in inorganic pigments and materials in Germany for BASF, as well as new technologies and effect materials in his company's performance chemicals research division. He is an expert in pearlescence, optical thin film materials, fine particles, and colloid chemistry. He has three degrees, a bachelor's degree from Millersville University, a PhD in chemistry from Clarkson University, and a law degree from Pace Law School. Curtis, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this year's panel once again. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate the introduction. I also thank EESI for the opportunity and the privilege to speak at this important event. Uh, before I talk about some of the real important Department of Energy programs that we support and that we're involved in, I would really like to just give a very quick overview about BASF. May I please have the next slide? Thank you so much. BASF is the largest chemical company in the world. We have about 115,000 employees with about 18,000 employees in North America. We create chemistry for a sustainable future. That's our tagline. We combine economic success with environmental protection and social responsibility. Our sales globally for 2020 were about 71.5 billion and about 16.4 billion in North America. BSF has at approximately 150 production and research and development sites throughout North America and operates Verbund sites in Geismar, Louisiana and Freeport, Texas. The Verbund concept is one of our key strengths. It links production in an integrated and efficient manner to save resources and energy. An example of this would be a byproduct or even a waste product from one manufacturing facility is then used as a key raw material in another manufacturing facility next door or within the same structure. Another example would be exothermic reaction heat produced in one facility is used to create steam for another facility. BSF has a very strong presence in research and development in North America with over 2,500 employees working in R&D at more than 40 sites. We partner with the top university institutions such as our California Research Alliance on the West Coast, which includes Caltech, the entire University of California system, and Stanford University. And our North American Center for Research and Advanced Materials on the East Coast, NORA, includes Harvard, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. All this comes together to create a robust business, manufacturing, and R&D platform. I'd like to now talk to you about some of the Department of Energy important programs that are impacting the energy landscape. May I please have the next slide? Thank you very much. You know, I do want to state all aspects of energy are priority. Technology and innovation, generation, distribution and infrastructure, efficient and storage energy. Let's look at areas of the Department of Energy that impact energy, efficiency, enhance sustainability. You may ask, you know, why does BSF support the Department of Energy and specific programs like RPE, the Advanced Research Project Agency, and why would we sponsor the RPE Annual Energy Innovation Summit every year? Well, it's not for R&D funding. BSF spent about $2 billion in 2020 on research and development, so us obtaining a few million for R&D research from the Department of Energy is not a key driver of our R&D strategy. RPE does a great job of interfacing with industry when developing programs to ensure the transformational needs of industry are targeted to provide solutions to the global needs. It's very interesting that the RPE programs align very well with the growth fields of the chemical industry at large, where transformational solutions are needed to move these fields forward. You know, RPE fulfills a very critical role by supporting high-risk energy research that industry will not engage in and provides a viable pathway to new opportunities. And this is a very important point that I think a number of people may not realize. Most industrial research and development is funded by the business units in the company with established manufacturing and technology platforms and are heavily focused on development to enable use of that existing platform. These platforms are representative of a very significant investment. 
Transformational technology solutions rarely fit in to existing assets and infrastructures. Hence, such of these areas are considered very high risk by industry and quite often are avoided. RPE programs in fundamental research are critical to demonstrate transformational energy technologies where industry will not invest due to the high risk. You know, once proof of concept is demonstrated and perhaps some initial scale up, then industry can, can engage and move the technology to the marketplace and move beyond the valley of death where so many great capabilities die. You know, we look at RPE and the Energy Innovation Summit for potential collaborative opportunities for individuals in the energy landscape. You know, can we find the next energy unicorn? You know, RPE is an innovation node and the glue of the energy innovation community of practice. Will the U.S. lead in transformational energy technologies without RPE? I don't think so. It's very important that RPE continues with its mission and that it continues to grow as we move forward. I'd also like to just talk about energy storage briefly. There are multiple Department of Energy funding mechanisms, whether it's EERE or RPE funding this technology. But you know, energy storage is the Achilles heel of renewable energy. In order for e-mobility, renewable, and distributive energy to become ubiquitous, there will need to be transformational breakthroughs in energy storage technologies. If wind, solar, or tidal energy is not used, it's lost. It has to be stored. So we must have breakthroughs in energy storage, which translates into more efficient use of renewable energy. It's that easy. And BSF is very active in the energy storage space. Let's just move on to plastics for a moment. You know, you may ask, what do plastics have to do with energy efficiency? Well, you know, plastics are produced almost exclusively from, from petroleum products. Many are single use. We need to move them to multiple use life cycles and eventually to circularity. We really need to start thinking about plastics, you know, as a critical raw material that must be put back into the stream of commerce. You know, we put way too much energy up front into making the plastic article and then not to use it again. It's just a lost energy opportunity. You know, the ability to reuse recycled plastic saves energy throughout the value chain is we're not starting back at the, you know, pulling petroleum out of the ground. We're starting with the material that we can use. You know, what we really want to be able to do is make sure that we can, for instance, take you know, this plastic uh, container that has one life and bringing it back into another life, maybe a more exciting life as a baby Yoda Lego. But again, you get my point. We want to bring these things throughout the life cycle multiple, multiple times. And, you know, where we really ultimately want to go is if you think of a piece of plastic as a piece of puzzle, we want to be able to deconstruct that puzzle into individual pieces and then use those pieces as a critical new raw material or as a new monomer or as a platform chemical and bring it back into the cycling. You know, BSF is very engaged in this area. We launched our 10 cycling program, you know, to manufacture products from recycled plastic waste, and we will continue to invest in that area. Another area I'd like to mention is hydrogen, very important. And you've seen on the slide, there's a hydrogen roadmap. There's a plastic innovation challenge roadmap. You know, there's the energy storage room. You know, the hydrogen economy is here. It's used everywhere, hydrogen. Why? It's the highest energy content by weight of any chemical fuel, three times out of gasoline. It's used in power generation, synthetic fuels, hydrogen vehicles, critical chemical feedstocks for making ammonia, for instance, or fertilizer, to name a few. You know, hydrogen-based fuel cells are increasing in popularity for areas like forklifts. If you pay attention to what Plug Power is doing with their fuel cells, they're going into all sorts of forklifts and other vehicles for zero emissions. Very important, zero emissions. Very, very impressive. You know, so if we're conducting electrolysis of water for hydrogen production from whether it's solar, wind, geothermal, or other green energy methods, this will really allow for making true green hydrogen, which will be an incredible efficient, incredibly efficient and really sustainable energy source. So BSF also has a lot of activities in hydrogen production, particularly in the efforts of methane pyrolysis. So we can see here that the Department of Energy has a well-defined roadmap for a variety of these technologies, energy storage, plastic innovation challenge, hydrogen, and other areas as well that we really need to support and move them forward. Next slide, please. 
Finally, I'd like to just mention a couple uh, programs within the building technology office that are tremendous and of great importance to BSF and other industries. Of course, these programs are impacting energy efficiency in the built environment. You know, the chemical industry develops various you know, sustainable and resilient materials for the built environment, such as our BSF's Disaster Durable Solutions, which is a whole portfolio of products for the built environment. And you know, these materials enhance the mechanical integrity of the building uh, and also support building codes to focus on energy efficiency. They're very important. I'd like to mention the Building Energy Codes Program, which we think is a great program. You know, this helps provide technical assistance to states and local governments to adopt and implement energy codes. And we heard some of this already today. Uh, the programs help municipalities that claim they have not, you know, enough resources to implement and update codes. And that's very true. These programs do need to be funded more so that these municipalities can adopt these more energy saving codes. You know, we care about updating and adopting new energy codes because we're a supplier building materials that deliver efficiency and high performance in housing. You know, we all know that the BTO is striving to reduce, you know, by, by 2025, they want to reduce the energy for space conditioning and water heating in single family homes through retrofits by 40% compared to 2010 levels. That's a big jump, and I think we can do it. I also do want to mention uh, two other areas, uh, rest check and calm check. These are wonderful tools to want to determine compliance, whether it's international energy conservation codes or local codes. And you can go on and use these tools to put in a well-defined area with the number of windows and how thick your insulation is and so forth. And it will let you know whether you're compliant with the code. Finally, I would just like to mention, you know, the Building America program about efficiencies. You know, this leverages building science, expertise, innovation, and applied research for high performance homes. You know, Building America partners with other organizations to leverage funding towards developing innovative energy efficient solutions to the res residential construction, both new and retrofit. So for instance, like roofing. And also I wanna mention, don't forget about their Energy Star certification program, which is available for energy efficient homes, not just appliances, very important program. So BSF is part of this entire energy technology landscape that brings energy efficiency and sustainability. And it's for these reasons we support these DOE programs very substantially. So in conclusion, I really hope I've provided you a glimpse into BSF in North America and why we think the Department of Energy, especially RPE and energy efficiency programs are so important. And there's really a, a very important comment I wanna make in, in leaving. These are bipartisan issues concerning energy. And we should really reunite around these in a bipartisan fashion. You know, let's continue to support DOE. Let's see these programs grow and really move us to circularity energy efficiency. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Curtis, for your presentation today. Um, really, pleasure. really appreciate it. Um, just want to just very briefly acknowledge that we did lose audio for a minute um, at the very beginning of Curtis's presentation. So we'll do our best to fill that in uh, on right. the backside for folks who were, um, well, it's, it, it's riveting. I, I've, I've listened to that presentation for four years in a row and I still really enjoy it. Um, oh, and that's not being facetious at all. It's excellent. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that we, we will do our best on, on our end to go back and fill that in. Um, thank you so much to our panelists uh, for a wonderful set of presentations. We are running about on time, actually, uh, at the end of time. So unfortunately, uh, we're not going to really have a whole lot of time for Q&A. Um, but we did collect a couple questions, and we will do our best to respond to whomever uh, sent us questions in. Um, Vicki, you had one addressed to you, and we'll do our best to, to follow up with folks um, so that everyone gets their questions answered. Um, you know, our panelists covered a ton of ground today, um, and if you missed any of it, I just want to make a quick reminder or say a quick reminder that uh, everything is available uh, at www.esi.org. Uh, there will be a webcast, there will be written summaries, there will be slides, and so if you have questions about state energy program, weatherization assistance program, building technologies office, codes, standards, federal energy management program, affect. Uh, and as well as Vehicle Technologies Office, Advanced Manufacturing Office, DOE does a lot. Uh, and this uh, present, these sets of presentations today is a great way to get a quick overview of all of that uh, very, very important work. Um, and also uh, for our congressional staff and our audience, help put these programs in the context of the benefits they provide, jobs, resilience, emissions reductions, lower utility bills, 
uh, and the list literally goes on and on. Um, would like to thank um, once again our hosts, Representative Marcy Kaptur and Representative Jeff Fortenberry, as well as their fantastic staff for helping us bring this uh, briefing to you today. Also like to say thank you to a very special co-conspirator, Aaron Lane, who has worked with me and um, our panelists on this briefing for four years running. Um, if you don't know Erin, she is a delight. She works very, very hard. Uh, and uh, we really couldn't do any of this without her. Uh, she works with Jennifer at Cascade. And um, what, what more can you say about Erin? She's just awesome. So thanks very much to you for helping with today. Um, also like to acknowledge all of the hard work um, at EESI. I'd like to thank Dan O'Brien, Sidney O'Shaughnessy, Amber Todorov, Anna McGinn, Omri Laporte, as well as our five intrepid interns who are helping us on Twitter and with notes and with questions and all of that. Celine, Hamza, Jocelyn, Kimmy, and Rachel. Um, we're going to put up a link in just a moment that has a link to a survey. Um, if you have any uh, comments, if you have any suggestions for future topics, um, we want to make sure that you take a moment. We really appreciate all the time you put into filling out these surveys. We read every response. We're always looking for choices to get better. So we'll put that link up in just a moment. Um, and uh, it would, um, this, as you know, uh, as you're watching right now, we are um, fortunate to have the services of our friend Troy, who brings this wonderful platform uh, to ESI so that we can all be seen at the same time and we can move through slides and he controls our our audio and he tells us that we have too much headroom uh, and maybe that we should move our monitors down and we have too much light, all of that. So thank you, Troy, for helping us bring this briefing for, uh, to folks today as well. Um, we will be back next Friday with a briefing with our friends at the Business Council for Sustainable Energy to take a look at their 2021 Factbook. A lot of the same issues that we discussed today will be addressed then, um, but uh, that is a must read. If you're not already reading uh, that Factbook that BCSE does with Bloomberg, uh, New Energy, NEF, uh, New Energy Finance. They are uh, just a tremendous resource. So hope to see you back next Friday. That's at two o'clock, not at noon, if I remember correctly. Uh, and in the meantime, the best way to follow EESI is to uh, sign up for our newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. You can do that by visiting us at www.esi.org or follow us on Twitter at EESI Online. Until next time, panelists, Vicki, Chris, Arjun, Jennifer, Curtis, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll go ahead and end it there. Hope everyone has a great rest of your day and happy weekend. Absolute pleasure. Have a great time. Thank you.